The mind will believe everything you tell it. Tell it great things. And honestly, it doesn't matter if you're born with these habits or if you adopt them. Just because you weren't born with them, that doesn't make any difference. If you make a decision, I'm going to acquire these habits, pick up these habits, adopt these habits and make them my own. And that's exactly what will happen. You see, you have a choice. Every day you get to choose how to speak to yourself. But you know what you don't get to choose? What you do to your body when you say, I'm an idiot. I knew I'd mess that up. I knew that relationship wouldn't work. I've been waiting for it to go wrong. What I'm going to do with you today is I'm going to take you first through the rules of the mind. They're my rules of the mind. I, I made them up, but I made them up over 33 years. And somebody said to me once, well, who are you to make this up? I went, well, someone's going to do it. I think 33 years of working with royalty and Olympic athletes gives me the right to say, these are the rules of the mind. And if ever you're stuck with a client, stuck with a child, stuck with an adult that needs some help, and you think, oh, I don't know what to do take them through the rules of the mind because it actually blows their mind. They go, well, I never knew that. I didn't understand that. And we will come after the rules of the mind to language patterns. Now, I've given you some slides on language patterns that are really for young children, but they also are very effective for adults. So let's do a quick little language thing right now. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to go, I'm going to try to remember these rules of the mind. I'm going to try so hard to memorize it. If only I could memorize that document. I wish I had a better memory. I hope I can remember that when I'm working with my own client. I really hope I can do what she does. I wish I could do it. I hope to do it. I'm going to try to do it. I really want to do it. And just focus on how you feel when you use the word wish, which is wishy-washy. I don't like wish. Wishing says to your mind, you haven't got a prayer, but you might as well wish. Because wishing just says, you're not going to do that. Oh, I wish. No one says, I wish I could get up in the morning and clean my teeth. I wish I could pick up that pencil and write a note. You don't say wish. You go, I'm doing it. So when you say to the mind, I wish I could, it says, yeah, me too. Get over it. When you say to the mind, I hope, I hope I get this right, it goes, yeah, well, keep hoping, because you're not going to do that. When you go, if only, your mind goes, well, you never managed it before, so keep on with the if only, why don't you? But when you do it differently, close your eyes again and go, I will memorize this. It's going in. I have a phenomenal memory. My memory is awesome. I read things and they empower me and they stick. I am remembering it all. I do this. I've got it. I have a phenomenal memory. I have incredible powers of recall and assimilation. And I remember everything. It has a totally different effect. And so you learn with language. I never let my clients say wish. I won't allow them to say the word but. I could do that, but no, we never say but. And we also never say should. My therapist said to me, excuse me, swearing, should is shit, and never use that word. I should, I say I could. I should go to the gym. I could go to the gym, but I know it's my fault. I'm not making the effort. So with young children, just changing one word will change their life. I'll give you an example. My little girl would go to school, and she'd get to the gate and she'd come back. And I'd always say, what have you remembered? Could have said, what have you forgotten? There's only two words. What have you, and she goes, I've remembered my swimming kit. I've remembered my book. I've remembered my peak. I go, that's fantastic. You have such a great memory that when you get to the gate, you remember and back you come. And very quickly, she didn't have to come back because I never said, what have you forgotten today? Oh my God, your mind is like a sieve. What's wrong with you? You get to the gate and I never do that. And you forget, why can't you be like me? I have my little bag by the door. I put everything the night before. And I never did that. I said, what have you remembered? So here's just one word. And my clients really taught me the power of words because I'd see the ones who'd come and go, I wish I could do that. 
oh, thanks, Marissa, for all this. I could do that, but I know I ought to do that, and I should, but. And so I started banning words. I said, when you come in this office, you're not allowed to go wish, but hope. I work a lot with infertile women, and the ones who don't get pregnant always say that, I, I wish I could get pregnant. And then when they get pregnant, they say, I'm so scared of losing it. I'm not going to tell anyone just in case I lose it. I'm like, well, but what are you saying to your baby? It's in the womb, the most developed sense is hearing. I'm not even going to tell anyone you're here because I have no faith you're going to make it. I go, how about sending the scans out to your parents and showing them, this is my baby, it's staying, my body made it, my body is so super smart. My body is going to carry this baby to full term. This is my one chance in the world to be God. I'm making a miracle here. And my body is growing that baby physically, and I'm growing and nurturing that baby emotionally and every day I tell it, today your spine is forming. This week your mouth and lips are forming and your ears are forming and it sends a message to the brain that goes, this is working, whereas running to the bathroom every hour to just see if you're spotting, saying, oh, I'm really scared of losing it, sends a message to the mind and one of the rules of the mind, and it's the best rule, is that Every thought you think and every word you say forms a blueprint and your mind must work to make that blueprint real. So when you say, I can't remember anything, I'd lose the eyes in the back of my head if they weren't fixed in there because I just can't remember anything. Your mind goes, that's a blueprint. Let me take you to it. And when you say, my memory is phenomenal, foolproof. In fact, I'm like human Google. When I read an exam, the minute I read the question, my mind has already gone to work, found the answer, and I, it stays in my head right through until I write it on the paper. Then I read the next question, the same thing happens. As I read the question, Google says, here's the answer. I work with children all the time with exam stress, and they come in. I was a little boy last year who had... Um, I think there were 17 children applied for every place in his school, and he flunked the mocks. And I'm like, darling, you're supposed to flunk the mocks. It's great to flunk the mocks. You know what mocks are, don't you? Oh, so in England, when you're taking an exam, you have a mock exam, maybe six weeks before you take the exam, just to see how you do. And then they say, well, you did terribly, you did really well, and because you did really well, you're going to pass that exam, and because you did terribly, you're going to fail. In fact, the ones who do well in the mocks get so complacent, they often don't do so well in the actual exam. And the ones who do badly think, wow, I need to up my game, I need to revise more and study more. So when he came in and said, my mummy was so upset because I got really bad marks in the mocks, I went, that's fantastic. What were you worth on? He said, the, 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 the writing, what did you do? So I didn't read the instructions correctly and I didn't use the right words. But that's fantastic. So what did you need to do? And just by changing his language, I didn't use the right words and explained to him that he could do it and telling him that his mind was like Google. Then I was asking him some questions about Harry Potter. And I said, how do you know these answers? Have you studied Harry Potter? He went, no, I just really like it. I said, well, see how clever your mind is. So when you're working with a kid that says, I don't know, ask them about James Bond. Ask them about something that they like and go, how do you know this? They go, I don't know. How do you know? Wow, you're so smart. Because when they like something, they remember. And part of school is liking something. So with this little kid, he got into that school. I knew he'd get in because he came in like that and he left like that. He was like, I'm going to nail this. I know what to do. My mind is like Google. And I will say to all my clients, whether they're a seven-year-old taking an exam or someone taking a medical exam or the bar, I say, what? Ever you're reading, your focus narrows down. You say the word narrow down, and when you say narrow down, everything fades away. You're absorbed in that paper. You have phenomenal powers of concentration, 
comprehension, recall, retention, and assimilation. And I, I say words that help you do the next one. Comprehension, comprehension, retention, recall, assimilation. I say it over and over again because the mind believes what you tell it. So let's go through the rules of the mind. Here is the first one. What is expected tends to be realized. When you say to a child, I don't know what's wrong with you. Your brother was in my class last year and he was so good. Why can't you learn? Why can't you sit still? Why are you so disruptive? What is wrong with you? You're making words that form a child's blueprint. And exactly the same for adults. I'm referring this a lot to children, but for the therapist here, those children come in as your clients. But it's just the same for adult. If, if your boss says to you, uh, uh, can you do this? And you go, oh my God, I, I'm going to have to race through it. And I'm going to have to rush it. I haven't got enough time to prepare. I know I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to go on stage, open my mouth and go, oh, oh, oh. Well, when you say that, it tends to be realized. And here's one of my favorite rules of the mind. The mind responds to words that make a picture. So in America, they were giving these kids pencils called don't do drugs. And as they sharpened them, the word don't disappeared. And they said, do drugs. Not very smart. Need to put that the other way around. What is expected tends to be realized. When a child is doing something like climbing a tree and the mother goes, you're going to fall. You're going to break your leg. Oh my God, you're going to break your ankle. You can make that happen. And when you say to the child now, I know you're climbing the tree. Look where you're putting your hands. Look where you're going to place your feet. Focus on what you're doing. That will be realized. So in powerful language, you can never say you're going to fall. You're going to mess that up. You're going to ruin everything. That's just not going to work out. You have to say the opposite. Okay. I've only got 10 minutes to prepare my speech. I only need 10 minutes. I've only got 10 minutes to get there. That's exactly how much time I need. And if I'm late, I wasn't supposed to be there on time. I have a belief now when I get to a party late, it's because it wasn't, I wasn't meant to get there early. I no longer go, oh my God, I'm so late. This is going to be terrible. In fact, I was recently going in a cab across town to get a train to work with a football team. And we got stuck in traffic. And so I was playing a game. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to miss the train. This is terrible. I'm going to ruin my reputation. The team are going to be so upset. And I felt really sick. And then I started to say, the trains run every 20 minutes. It doesn't matter what's 20 minutes. My material's so great. They have lots of time. After all, they finished um, practicing at 3 o'clock. And, and it was fine. So all the way there, I was playing a game and I actually got the train on time, but they really wouldn't have minded. But I could have ruined my day, made myself panicky and sweaty, but going, oh my God, I haven't got enough time and now it's all ruined. And it's never ruined. You can come back from anything. And then I worked with a client who had cancer and had to go into this MRI scanner. And every time I saw him, he's like, I can't, I can't do it. I can't get in that scanner. And I wonder, he said, well, I feel like I'm in my coffin. I feel like it's a premonition of my death. And when I get in the scanner, I think, well, I've got cancer and I'm going to die. And what, he said, well, I freak out. I press the button. I have to come out. And they keep saying, look, you've got to. I can't. I can't even be in there for two seconds, which is not true. And say, I, can, I can't do it for even a second. He probably was in there for a few minutes. I said, look, the words you say to yourself in that scanner, this is a premonition of my death. I feel like I'm in a coffin. I feel like I'm suffocating and I can't do it. That's a blueprint. And your mind doesn't like those words. So how about these words? How about saying, I'm in my bed at home and I'm just so chilled and I could lie here for hours. I'm chilled, I'm relaxed, I'm blissed out. You must use words that make a picture. You can't go, oh, I'm okay, really. I'm quite good. I'm not bad. This is okay. Because... When I say the words, okay, not bad, where's the picture? There's no picture, it's what I call fluff. When you say I'm chilled, I'm blissed out, I'm ecstatic, I'm just lying here and I could do this for 
hours. It's just so cool. The mind goes, you're right. And when you go, I'm in a coffin and I'm suffocating, the mind goes, you're right. See, here's the great thing. You can choose any words you like. You can go, well, we're all going to be negative and this half's going to be positive. That's your choice. You know what you can't choose? What you do to yourself when you say, I'm an idiot, I'm a moron, I'm a retard, I've got rocks for brains, everything goes wrong. Who would ever like me? I've got cellular, I'm a single parent, I've got no chance, blah, blah, blah. I didn't go to college, so I couldn't possibly do what you do. I got kicked out of college, by the way, so you can definitely do what I do. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I can look at my life and say being fired, being dumped, and being kicked out of college. Thank you, God, for putting that up to me because it changed my life. It was the best thing. Rejection has been one of the best things that ever happened to me. Being the least favorite kid, if I could have my life again, I'd go back and be the least favorite kid because I thought I'm going to show my parents that I'm something. And if I was the favorite, I wouldn't have done that. I would have had a totally different life. So with my client, I was saying, you know, these words are really important. So he got in the scanner, he stayed there for hours. And he said that when he came out, all the nurses and doctors came in and gave him a standing ovation. He said it was more powerful than his last business deal because he felt so good. Some years later, I had to go in a scanner. I thought, well, I'm just gonna play with this. I love playing with words, so I lay there. And I was going, I'm so chilled, this is so good. How many of us have said, I'd love 20 minutes to myself? Well, here I am, 20 minutes to myself. I can lie here and do nothing. No one's going, can you proof this copy? Can you answer this email? Can you speak to this client? My daughter's going, mommy, my boiler's broken in my apartment. Can you come over right now and fix it? I had 20 minutes to myself. And I was going, I'm so chilled. And then I thought, let's do the opposite. So I was like, I, I, I'm in a coffin. I got claustrophobia. I feel like I'm trapped. And all the buzzers went off and I didn't even know I was moving. And then they speak to her, I said, Marissa, you have to lie completely still. Stop moving. So I had to go back into I'm chilled, I'm ecstatic, I'm blissed out. And I love doing that. And it's a really good thing to do to yourself. I'm late, I've ruined everything. I have all the time I need. You see, you have a choice. Every day you get to choose how to speak to yourself. But you know what you don't get to choose? What you do to your body when you say, I'm an idiot. I knew I'd mess that up. I knew that relationship wouldn't work. I've been waiting for it to go wrong. In fact, the day we got married, I stuck stickers on all my stuff so that when we got divorced, there'd be no confusion. <laughs> I was already planning the miscarriage. I didn't buy anything for my baby. I mean, who does that? Lots of people, apparently. They're all my clients, and they plan for stuff to go wrong. They say, I sent my kid to college, and I said, don't worry, you're probably going to hate it. Here's a credit card so you can get a return ticket back in a week's time. They plan it, and you don't want to plan it. You want to ban it. So words are really powerful. You can choose to be negative or positive. That's your choice, but you cannot choose what you do to yourself when you use negative language. So the first rule of the mind, what you expect is realized. Who thinks that's true? So here's my advice to you, expect amazing things then. If what is expected tends to be realized, expect the best. Expect love and success and an amazing life because you know what? It will probably be realized really fast if you expect it. Imagination is more powerful than knowledge when dealing with your own mind and the mind of others. If I said to any of you, come and stand on this chair, who would come and stand on this chair? I'll give you $100 to stand on this chair. Sure, if I said, well, now the chair is, that, is on top of that spire on the highest building in Tallinn, who's going to climb up and stand on it for $100? Who would do that? Some people would, because they've got a good imagination. They go, if I can stand on it there, I can stand. And most people go, no, I could fall. If you've got a little tiny plank up here, you can walk the plank when it's on the floor. Put the plank between two high-rise buildings. Who's going to walk it? Not many people, because the imagination that you could fall and kill yourself is way more powerful than the knowledge that I did this on the ground. It's wide enough. Fear of flying. 
knowledge says it's actually the safest place in the world. The most dangerous part of a flight is actually the drive to the airport. That's way more dangerous than being in the plane. Do you think the imagination cares? We'll go in a flying coffin. I'm hurtling through the air, and that guy looks like he's come straight out of ISIS, and he's in the bar. I think he's going to blow up the plane. <laughs> And then you feel terrible. The other person's going, I'm watching a movie. I've always wanted to watch The Shape of Water. This is so great. Here's my time again to do nothing. So whatever you imagine will defeat logic, will defeat knowledge. And when dealing with children, people do logic. Like, Why are you so bad? Why can't you get it? What's going on? Why are you so naughty? And that doesn't work. I never say to kids, why are you bad? I go, what happened to you? I was working with a little kid recently who always played up before lunch and would get hysterical after every meal. And I'd actually been in an orphanage in Zimbabwe and I'd seen that a lot, that at the end of the meals, the kids start weeping uncontrollably because they don't know when the next meal is coming. And they go, look, you're in an orphanage, it's fine. We have food, you'll be fed three times a day. It takes about two years for those children to stop crying as they remove the plates because the emotion is, when's the next meal coming? So this little boy was really difficult at school and he'd been to three different schools. And one of the teachers contacted me and I said, when does he do it? She said, well, he always does it before meals. And I said, you should ask him not why he does it, but what happened to him. And then the mother came in and said, well, well I adopted him at one. He was born to crackheads. And he cr used to cry when I left the room. And when I read his notes, his parents would leave the room for three days. And he didn't get fed very much. And so he's got this panic about not being fed. And I said, but well, you should tell the school that. And of course, you can't logically say to a child, look, you're going to be fed every four hours. You have to go, look, you have some memories. They're really sad, but mommy is going to put some nuts in your bag. And you're always going to have something. And you can't do it logically because feeling is more powerful than logic. The feeling you're going to die on a plane will always wipe out the logic that this is the safest way to travel. One of my clients said, please help me. So I've done the logic. I went to British Airways flying course. I walked into the cockpit wearing shorts and I lost control of my bowels in front of everyone. Now I'm even more scared about flying because this was a course to make you better. They were logically showing me all the controls. When they said they were taking off, I had a terrible accident. I knew it was bad because the pilot put a mask on and I had to be taken off that plane. And now I'm even further back from ever flying because logic doesn't work. Emotion does. And so I would talk to her and say, you know, you have to pretend you're at the front. You have to say when you're on the plane, I love it. Oh my God, flying thrills me. It elates me. It empowers me. It delights me. I love flying. Your mind goes, you're right. And when you go, I'm going to be blown out of the sky, it's a smithereens, your mind goes, you're right. Because here's another rule of the mind. It does not care if what you do is right or wrong good or bad, true or false, healthy or unhealthy, just lets it in. So let me show you. Put your hand in front of your mouth. You may have done this before, but let's do it again. Put your hand in front of your mouth like you're about to eat. Close your eyes. And imagine you have a big, fat, juicy, gorgeous lemon in your hand. I want you to breathe in that gorgeous, gorgeous lemon smell. I want you to squish that lemon and feel the waxy surface. Open your mouth, still with your eyes closed. Shove that lemon in your mouth and eat it. I want you to bite the flesh of that lemon. Suck out the flesh. Suck out the lemon. Start chewing it, eating it. Eat that whole entire half of a lemon. Keep going, keep sucking, chewing and swallowing. And open your eyes. And put your hand up if you made saliva. So here's a question for you. Where was the lemon? Where was it? Say that again. Yeah, people say there wasn't one. Oh, there was. There definitely was a lemon. It was in your imagination. You know there's no lemon. You go, what's going on here? I know there's no lemon. Why am I pumping out saliva and going like that? What am I doing that for? I know it's not there. But your mind believes it. The mind will believe everything you tell it. Tell it great things. Success blocks. You probably think I'm talking about your career, your blocks to promotion, your blocks to 
having your own business or doing a startup. But really, success encompasses everything. Your success as a parent, your success as a partner, your success as a colleague, your success as a friend. So I'm going to tell you lots of stuff and help you. And we're going to do some really interesting stuff today to get rid of any of your blocks. So here's the truth. When you're a little baby in the womb, most babies feel lovable. There, there are a few exceptions, but very, very minor. So when you're in the womb, everything you need is there. You get food 24 hours a day whenever you want to eat. It's there. It's always 75 degrees. You have room service. There's a person there that you're connected to. So in the womb, babies have an interesting belief, which is everything I want, I can have. And so when a baby is born, it has the same belief. No baby ever goes, you know what? My mom is so tired. I shouldn't really cry tonight and wake up. You know what? My mum spent ages bleaching this little T-shirt and I shouldn't throw up this broccoli, that organic broccoli that just went ages purying for me. Babies have this belief. I don't have to have what I don't want and I can have everything that I do. And if I want attention, I'll cry for it in the middle of the night. If I want to be fed, I'll cry for that. If I want something, I can have it. It's actually very good news to recognize that you were born with a belief that said, I can have whatever I want because what I'm going to help you to do today is to reactivate, remanifest, regenerate and recreate what you were already born with. Since you were already born with it, recreating it is going to be easy. So you're born knowing you can have everything and, and babies just don't have this belief. They can't have what they want. If you ever watch a child trying to reach for something, they don't go, oh, it's out of reach. They try and try and try. Mm -hmm. They fall over a lot when they're trying to get up, but they are wired to make it. The first thing they try to eat, they get food in their hair, in their eye, in their ear, none in their mouth. But they never say, you know what, I, I just can't do this eating stuff. I need to be fed. But very early on, certainly before the age of three and definitely before the age of seven, things happen to us that make us start to believe, oh, hmm, I can't have that. You know, I was in a store not long ago. And I heard a mother say to her child, who was about five, you can have some chocolate. Go and pick whatever you want. And the kid came back with this huge box of chocolate. And the mother went, who do you think you are? We can't afford that. You're so greedy. I can't stand how greedy you are. Look at you. You pick the most expensive thing in the shop. You're just greedy. That's outrageous. Now you're not having anything. And I'm thinking, isn't that funny? Because she said to her kid, go and have whatever you want. And he didn't understand that he was being greedy. And many of my clients tell me these stories that on Christmas Day, they start to cry because their brother got a bike and they got a doll's house and they wanted a bike. And the parents who spent so much money getting the doll's house kind of lost the plot and went, you're greedy, this is disgusting, look at you, you're so jealous of other people. I don't like greed. You're not going to have anything now. And on my course this week, one of our grads was saying, every day that I want, his parents would go, I want doesn't get. If you ask for anything, you get nothing. And we don't always have parents that are mean. Sometimes they're very, very well-meaning, but they say things like, well, no one in our family's ever been to college. You're never going to make it without a university degree. We're not that kind of people. And, you know, all the things we believed about success have been smashed out of the ballpark. Here's a belief that isn't true anymore. If you get a job, you're set for life. Years ago, if you went to work for Decca or Sony or Poly Polydor or pressing records, you were set for life. No more. Having a job for life is not quite what it was because we realized the way to make massive income is to work for ourselves. Getting a publishing deal used to be the best way to make money. I'm an author. I've had four books published and I published two myself because many people now say, you know what, there's actually more money in self, I mean, you get to keep all the profit as long as you're smart enough and have the wherewithal to do all this promotion to get a book to sell. Here's another belief. If you go to university, your future is guaranteed. That isn't true anymore. I know many people with a college degree who can't find work. And I've also met people who are brought up in rural India and Nigeria with no education, who managed to teach themselves on a laptop and have gone on to have a phenomenal business an incredible business. And so the success blocks are nothing to do with your education or your background or your status. They used to be, but they're certainly not anymore. And the world has changed very, very fast. 
And there is a glass ceiling and it's in here. The glass ceiling for men and women is in your mind. When you believe, I can't do that, that's out of my reach, I'm not educated, I don't have a degree, I'm never going to make that, then other people will pick up that fear. And so I'm going to help you today recognize that if you want success, if you want financial success, business success, having your own business, relationship success, if you want love success, health success, whatever success you want, there's one thing you must have, and it is not a degree. It's not a degree at all. It's a belief that you are worth it. Belief without talent can do more for you than talent without belief. I've met many people who have huge talent. They've written a book. They've never had it published. There are other people who really don't have that much talent, but such phenomenal self-belief that they make it anyway. But if you have both, if you have talent and belief, if you have drive and ambition, you can absolutely make it. So I let's do some work rather than just hear me talk, because you probably listen to a lot of TED Talks and that's all great, but I always believe you want to feel this stuff rather than hear it. So I want you to take a minute if you can and try to remember the things you heard about success when you were growing up. I'll give you some examples. One of my um, the girls I trained in RTT who's now amazingly successful. She's got her own radio show, her own newspaper column. I think six of the people I've trained in RTT this year have published books. Books that are doing incredibly well. One has become a bestseller. They're all making their mark in the charts in different categories. But she said to me, you know, when I was growing up, my dad had a shop and we lived above the shop. And because it was a shop, he worked six and a half days a week. Um, didn't work on a Sunday afternoon, but had to work on a Sunday morning because he did the newspapers. And every Sunday afternoon, he'd lie on the sofa with a tremendous migraine and go, that's the price you pay for working for yourself. There's no holiday pay. There's no time off. You can never be sick. And she said, you know, I looked at that. I never, I never want to do that. I never want to have that much stress of being responsible for myself. I, I'd, I'd rather be employed. Another of my um, patients told me that her father used to take antacids every morning at breakfast and go, you know, I've got an ulcer because the stress of being a manager, I'm a manager and it's so stressful and I've always got this ulcer and the stomach ache and the digestion and the chronic pain because of the response of managing other people. So one person said it was stressful to work for himself and have no manager. The other one said it was stressful having to manage other people. And that girl said, I watched my dad take all these pills and I'm thinking, I don't want that. I'd rather be poor than live like that. I'd rather be a hippie than live like that. And that's what she was when I met her. She wanted to come on my course and she could not get the money together. She said, no matter how much money I make, I can't keep it. And I sent her a recording on wealth wiring and she made enough money within six weeks to come on the course. And now she's very successful. But you learn what you live. When you're little, you grow up and you learn what you live. Now, when I grew up, my father was a very, very eminent head teacher, quite unhappily married, but also devoted to his job, loved his job, adored it. And he so wanted to spend all his time with the children that he would, in his weekends and evenings, do all his paperwork so that when he was in that school, nothing could take him away from the children that he loved to help. And every time my parents had a fight, my father would pick up his briefcase and go to work. My mother would lie on the sofa and cry, and he would go to work. I remember looking at that thinking, mm, you know what? You need to have a really engrossing job so that when it all goes wrong, it doesn't hurt you as much. And that was not an if, it was definite when. So what we see shapes as we learn what we live. So let's do a little something together right now. I want you to take a few minutes, close your eyes, because it's better with your eyes closed. And I want you to remember the things you were told. Money doesn't grow on trees. People like us, we're not the kind of people that work for other people. We know our place. You can make money, but you can never keep it. It's too risky to work for yourself. It's too much of a risk to be self-employed. You need a steady job. Uh, don't get above your station. This is as good as it gets. 
So close your eyes if they're not really close, and just try and hear your mother or father, even your teacher. My daughter, who's an amazing artist, her art teacher said to her, do not apply to a good art school, you won't get in. Just apply to an average one because you're average. And I was so upset that she told her that. When I went to meet her, she said to me, I don't know why you're upset. Every child in this class is average. That one's average, that one's average. I said, but there are Japanese kids in this class who are trilingual. She said, well, and I said, you know what? I just realized something. You are an average teacher, aren't you? That's all you can get out of these kids, average, because you're average. And how dare you tell my child to apply for an average art school when she is a gifted artist? Because she is a gifted artist. And I said to her, don't listen to that teacher. And she's, her whole career, all her income is made from being an artist. And she's very, very successful. But you've got to be very careful what you pick up. So what did your teacher say? What did your parents say? What did your mother, father, grandmother say that's given you a success block, a limiting belief about success, a limiting thought about how much you can make or how much you can achieve? And here's another success block we have, which is if I make it, people won't like me. I remember when I drove home to visit my family and I got a Porsche and my uncle was like, oh, look at you showing off, trying to be a poshy. And he was very disparaging about it. I didn't really mind. I didn't mean it. He just had this very fixed belief that working class people should always stay working class and should never get above their station. If they did, they were just showing off and to be put back in their place. And I was quite lucky that I didn't let him make me feel uncomfortable because he tried hard to make me feel uncomfortable. So it, these beliefs, we make our beliefs, but then our beliefs make us. But then even weirder, we go out into the world and it starts to mirror and match and honor whatever you believe. If you believe there's only a certain amount of money I can make, I can never make more. If I make more, I'll never know who my friends are. Many women have this belief, which is not true anymore, which is if I make money and I'm a success, I'll never find a guy. There's no guy that's going to want to marry someone who makes more than them. You know, there's a new word now. I love this word, latte papa. And it comes from Sweden where men take maternity leave after the mother. Mother takes time and then he does. And see all the men in Starbucks with a little baby strapped on their back with their coffee and they're called latte papas. But 50 years ago, a man that stayed home and was daddy and did daddy day from as a house husband was, was ridiculed. It's not really like that now. Women who went out to work and really went through the ranks were called all kinds of names and calling, including ball breakers. And it's different now. Now you can have a life you can go to the top we have so many great women role models and men too but just one more time i want you to really do this this time close your eyes hear what your mother said hear what your father said hear what your teacher said hear what your community said or your church said or your head teacher said or your brother or sister or cousin said about success the price you pay is too high Something has to give. If you have a great business, it takes all your time, your children will suffer, or your relationship will suffer, or your health will suffer. And if you believe that to be the case, it becomes the case because you make your beliefs, your beliefs make you, and then the world starts to match your belief. And in the Bible, it says you are what you believe. And it's such a shame it doesn't say, but you know what? Your beliefs are yours to change. So let's change those beliefs now. I want you to do something that might seem really silly, but this is based on something called neuroplasticity. Your thoughts start off as a little tiny thread and then they become a rope, then they become like a cable, like a super high where you have a neuron you've made to a thought. And because medicine is so advanced now, you can look into people's brains and see thoughts creating neurons and see good thoughts creating good neurons and good thoughts unraveling negative ones. So let's do a bit of unraveling right now. Whatever you heard your parents say, like women can't make it, women will never succeed through the ranks. No man will respect a woman who earns more than she does. No man would want to be with a woman who earns that amount of money. A, a man would want his wife to stay. And I remember even when I was 25 and dating someone, and that wasn't that long ago, he said I would never let my wife work. And that wasn't that long ago, but he had this belief because he was Jewish, that 
a Jewish man would be less thought of if his wife went out to work and she should stay at home. And I was so shocked that he really had this. I'd never marry a woman that went to work. I wouldn't allow my wife to work. Everything, well, that's not going to work out because I'm not staying home and doing laundry. There we go. That was a belief that he had. And I, I met him later and he had two marriages, both ended in divorce because he didn't want his wives to go to work. Really bizarre. That was a very old belief. So let's go back to you. Get your belief and I want you to say out loud, that's not me because, and then you're going to finish the sentence. I'm going to say, that's not me, that belief that I need to have a great career so when my relationship ends, I'll have something to occupy me, stop me getting desperate. That was my father's belief. He needed that belief. I don't need that belief. So whatever it is, I want you to do it with me now. You ready? One, two, three. That's not me because... Finish that sentence, say it to the screen. That can never be me ever again for the rest of my life because, one more time, that will not, cannot be me ever, ever, ever again because. And by the way, if you're thinking, I have no idea what beliefs I picked up, it's okay. When you're next around your brother, sister, mother, father, friends from school, ask them, you know, what were we taught? We taught that, you know, it's really hard to get stuff and then it, you can't enjoy it. Um, ask people. And then even when this today is over, you can still go back and think about the beliefs and say, that's not me because that will never be me because that cannot be me ever, ever, ever again because. But let me help you do this another way. Take out a pen. And a bit of paper or even type this into your phone or your iPad and I want you to again write out some of your success beliefs I know you have them we all have them I, well, I know when I was a single parent I really believed that if I was successful my daughter would pay the price because I'd be working 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 and I wouldn't see her and, and that wasn't true but I allowed myself to believe that and if I hadn't believed that, I would have been even more successful than I am much earlier. And then I realized that it's just a belief. Everything is a belief. So write out a belief you had. My belief about success is it's very hard to get there. When you get there, people envy you. They don't like you. They try and take your position off you. Or is really stressful. Success will make you ill. Success will cause my health to suffer. I won't have friends anymore. I won't know who my friends are. They might want to live off me. I'll never know if I'm worth anything because of success. So I want you to write that down. Write out everything. My success belief is finish that sentence. And you find you can almost do this thing called automatic writing. My success block is write that out. My success block is and finish it do it automatically and if you're not sure give yourself a little time to think about hmm what did i hear all the time when i was a kid what did people say oh no wonder um she's on her own who's going to marry a ball breaker like that no wonder he's on his own he's always working who's going to tolerate that or he's just so stressed no wonder he can't find no wonder he's ill always working or Oh, you're so boring. You always talk about work. Why can't you take a day off? You're no fun anymore because you're always working. So write it out. My success blocks are, my blocks to success are, and then I want you to write out something else. Who told you that? Because I promise you, you weren't born with that belief. You did not come onto the planet thinking, I can't have success. You know, when I used to say to my little girl, what do you want for Christmas? She goes, Mommy, I'd like a Barbie palace and a swimming pool and a horse and a pet monkey. And she wasn't greedy and she wasn't ridiculous. She watched these shows and she thought she could have a pet monkey. I think she's seen Michael Jackson's monkey. So I'll have a monkey and a horse because they're like that. They believe they can have everything. And so we say, don't be ridiculous. Who do you think you are? That's just so silly. And all the clients I see in therapy go back to that. And all my grads go back to that too, to these beliefs that they can't have what they should have. So write out, who told me that belief? What did they know? 
And where did they learn that belief? Where did they get that belief? And we see my grandmother had very, very different beliefs to me. And she picked them up and raised her. And she was raised in a children's home for some of her life. So she had very different beliefs. One of my friends wanted to adopt a baby. And as she went through the adoption process, she was warned by someone, do not let those people know that you're wealthy. Don't tell them you have a holiday home abroad. Hide everything. And the social service said to me, you know, we don't like giving working class children to middle class mothers. Why should we? And so she hid everything, adopted this baby. It was a fantastic success. Asked for another one. And then they said, you know, if we'd have known that you were wealthy, we never let you have this baby. Because most babies that come into the system come from working class parents um, who can't afford to raise them. And we don't want them to go to people who expect too much of them. That was an absolute what they said. We don't want these children adopted by people who expect too much of them. We want them to adopt by people who don't expect a lot. Don't push them to go to college. Don't push them into private school. And I thought that was a really terrible expectation. It was a non-expectation, actually. But you see these beliefs that you're up against from the community, from people from everywhere. But you don't have to believe them. So where did you get that belief from? Who told you that belief? What did they know? And where did they get it from? They probably got it from someone else. So it's really important to understand that you don't have to believe that anymore that you can have success, but if you want success, you must believe you are worth it. You cannot go and ask for a pay rise or a promotion or try to get crowdfunding if you don't think you're worth it. I worked on many, many shows, the kind of like an X Factor, where people come in to be auditioned for a job. And if they have this, oh, hmm, you don't, you don't really want me. I'm not really good enough. It, it kind of seeps out of their pores. If they come in with a look, I've got something amazing to offer the world. Then we sit up and go, oh, I can't wait to hear what it is. Because everyone on the planet is born with a gift, a talent. You have something that you're meant to do. And all you have to do, I promise you, is find out what you're meant to do and monetize it and what you're meant to do will always lie behind be connected to what you love to do the age of seven and 14 when i was seven i was always writing little stories and my mother kept them on they were always about children who didn't have love which is kind of interesting because i became a therapist and a writer and i have books published but all my child between seven and 14 i was writing 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 drawing little pictures to go with these books now I'm a writer. My daughter was always making clothes, even out of Kleenex with these little tiny dolls that she had. She'd make little costumes and clothes and now she has her own fashion line. I worked with someone else who said I was always doing puzzles as a kid and now I'm a strategist. Jo Malone, the very famous perfumer, was always just going in her garden picking little flowers and trying to make perfume from them. Uh, I know someone else who's a very famous chef, and that's all they did. They loved to cook. So what did you love to do in the age of 7 and 14? That is a key to your skill set, to your area of excellence, to what you must monetize. And if you're not sure, ask people. Ask people that you grew up with, what did I love doing? So I hope that's helping you understand that any block you have to success, any money block, any wealth block, any health block, any love block, even any sex block comes from this belief that I'm not worth it, I don't deserve it, other people can get this but I can't get it, it's too hard, the price I have to pay is too high. Because I can spend a long time talking to you about this today but there aren't that many success block beliefs and I've just told you what they are. The price I have to pay is too high. Doing that is too hard. I'll have to give up all my fun time. I'll never be able to watch my favorite shows or take a long bath or just do nothing at all because I'll be working, working, working. And if I work like that, I'll be boring. And if I work like that, I'll be alone. And if I work like that, I'll be stressed. And if I work like that, I'll be sick. I'll be ill. I'll be tired. I'll be dull. I'll be boring. I want to be the boss, but what if no one likes me? 
And you know, 70% of lottery winners who haven't had money and win the lottery will be broke within three years. That's an extraordinarily high figure, but it's very predictable. Human behavior is very, very predictable. It's predicted by what you believe. You know, Sean Connery, who grew up in poverty, had a picture of a gold Rolls Royce at the end of his bed. He said, I'm gonna have that car, I will make it. And it's just as easy to say that as to look at a Rolls Royce and go, no, I'll never get one of those. The likes of us, we, we don't get to have Rolls Royces. You know, we're, I'm living on welfare here. How is that ever gonna happen? I was watching a great interview with Michael Caine and he was saying that when he made it, he was a Cockney boy, a working class boy from a working class estate and he went for an audition. And it was only because the guy um, giving the audition was American and didn't realize he had a working class accent that he got cast in Zulu. So I never would have got that part in a million years if it hadn't been that the, the director, the producer, the casting agent was American. But that's all changed too, and he was talking about that, how once upon a time, you had to know your place, know your class. Maybe that's more so in Europe. But that just doesn't exist. The glass ceiling does not exist for men, for women, for anybody. So when you want to have something, think about what you want. Think about right now, what do you want? What is it that you really, really, really want? And then think about what you'd have to do to get one. Maybe it's more money. You see, if you go, I just want to be a millionaire, that won't work unless you think about what would I have to do to become a millionaire? And then I want you to think about who would benefit from you being a millionaire. You see, the more people who will benefit, the more reasons you have to be a millionaire, the more likely you are to make it. Why would I write a book? Who would read that book? What would benefit me from writing a book? And who else would benefit if I wrote a book? J.K. Rowling, who was a single mother and really living on the breadline. But when she wrote Harry Potter and became enormously wealthy, it didn't just benefit her. She has donated money timelessly to single parent charities. And we have many people who come and train with us in our TT and they say the same thing. Don't I need a degree in psychology to train with you? Shouldn't I be or have some kind of background in therapy, surely I can't turn up on your course. And we've had two cleaners who turned up on our course. One of them didn't tell anyone she was a cleaner, and there's no shame in that at all. In fact, it was a very smart job. She was a single parent with two kids, needed to work school hours, and it was the only way she could do that. But when you're cleaning, it's kind of what I call sweat labor. You work X hours, you get paid by the hour. You can never really make more than your hourly rate unless you work more hours and then don't have enough time to be with your children. Anyway, she came on our course. She did incredibly well. She's one of our most, most, most successful therapists. And then someone else wrote to me and said, you know, I'm a cleaner. And I listen to people tell me their problems all day. And I thought, I'm going to go on Marissa's course. And I just thought I could only afford the online course. And then I did it, and then I, I worked with this client, and she gave me first class tickets to Florida for all my family, so I changed her life. And she wrote to me and said that, and I wrote back and said, good, stop cleaning houses, you obviously can clean up people's lives. And I was telling the story in a room, and she was there, and she ran up to me, that was me, that was me. And she's told that story many times, and we have had beauticians and beauty therapists, massage therapists, hairdressers, police officers, firemen, uh, pilots, uh, uh, airline crew who've come on our course with no background in therapy at all and gone on to make an amazing career. One of them wrote to me and said, you know what, I did this for me, but I'm doing so well that both my kids are in private school. I never even thought that would happen. So please don't let yourself believe that if you haven't had a university education, a private education, um, one of the very fortunate educations that you can't make it, you can. Some of the most successful people in the world come from a, 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 a disadvantaged background. Let's say, I mean, look at Oprah Winfrey, look at Tony Robbins. They didn't have university degrees and look where they are now because they didn't have success blocks. They thought, no, I had the great privilege of meeting Naomi Campbell. And she had said, when someone, she, someone had said to me, you know, black girls don't get on the cover of Vogue, that door is shut. She went, shut, I'll kick it open. 
And I loved that. And she's been on the cover of Vogue many, many times. And this month's cover of Vogue is Zoe Kravitz, Zoe Kravitz's daughter. So that belief that black women do, don't do magazine covers, especially Vogue, it is not true anymore. So many things you're telling yourself are not true. So one more question. Why are you telling yourself stuff that holds you back? When you could tell yourself stuff that makes you sore. Somebody wrote to me this week and said, you know, I was listening to your talk and I realized because I draw for a living, I'm always saying I've got to draw faster, 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 I've got to draw faster. And when I listened to you, I thought, no, I should be saying, I draw really fast and I'm amazing. And I suggest because when you're any kind of artist, you have a choice. You can use your thoughts to limit yourself or you can use your thoughts to soar. When you have a brilliant mind, you can rationalize why you feel so bad, or you can talk yourself out of it. So use your thoughts to take off, not to ground you. Use your thoughts to move towards success instead of using your thoughts to move away from it. And many of you, without knowing it, are using your thoughts to move towards success instead of away from it. Imagine if you want to write a book and all you think about is it getting terrible reviews and no one buying it and no one liking it. You're using your thoughts to move away from being a published author. But you could use those thoughts and become a published author. In fact, the most successful book in the entire world now is Fifty Shades of Grey. And that is not a literary masterpiece, far from it. But you know what? She doesn't care. She is the richest author in history because she didn't sit down and think, hmm, this book's not very intellectual. She thought this book is going to cane it. It's going to make a fortune. I was just on um, this morning on NBC and she was on just before me and I met her. And she's very happy about how successful Fifty Shades of Grey has been. And she's a great lesson to all of you. You want something, the only thing that can hold you back is your own limiting beliefs. So what is hypnosis? Well, let me tell you what it is not. It is not a state of sleep. It's not a state of being unconscious and it's definitely not a state of being under someone's control. People are very scared. They watch a movie where someone clicks their fingers or waves a watch and that person barks like a dog or runs around like a chicken. Maybe you've seen that movie Get Out, but these are movies. It's not real. You see, hypnosis is actually a sleep of the nervous system. And I love hypnosis. It doesn't send you to sleep, but it wakes you up to your power, your potential, and even your greatness. So you have different brainwaves. You have alpha, beta, delta, and theta. Now, alpha brainwave is the most relaxed conscious brainwave, but delta is the brainwave you go into when you're deeply asleep, when you're dreaming when you're meditating, and indeed, when you're in deep hypnosis, you're using a delta brainwave. It's so natural. It's really safe, and you're using that brainwave to accept suggestions. So the most important thing to understand about hypnosis is that you have a critical factor in your mind. And let's imagine you said, hey, tomorrow, I'm going to go and give a talk. I'm going to give a talk in my local community about something I'm passionate about. And the critical factor goes, no, you're not. You can't speak in public. You're going to go bright red. You'll forget what to say. Hey, I'm going to go riding a horse. But the critical factor says, oh, you might fall, might not work. And you see, we all have our conscious mind. We think, I want to do this. I'd love to do that. I'm going to go on a diet today and just live on salad. The mind goes, who are you trying to kid? You've been on a diet for 20 years. You know you can't resist cake. So that's the critical factor. And the brilliant thing about hypnosis is it shuts down. It shuts down. So I can tell someone in hypnosis, you are an amazing speaker. You remember everything. You're word perfect. You're so good. I can say, hey, you've totally forgotten about smoking. You're indifferent to cakes. Instead of the little voice going, yeah, who are you trying to kid? It goes, wow, yes, I can do this. So your own critical voice shuts down. And what was your internal critic becomes your cheerleader. Hey, of course you can do it. Of course you can give a speech. Of course you can live without donuts. Of course. 
you can find the love of your life because you're deeply lovable. And when you can learn to shut down the inner critic and to turn on the inner cheerleader, wow, it's, it's a game changer. Now, there are some people who are more hypnotizable than other people. One in 10 people, 10% 10 of people are deeply hypnotizable. They're the people you see at a stage show, put up their hand, run on the stage, volunteer, and lo and behold, suddenly they're falling madly in love with a fire hydrant. They're falling madly in love with a broom, and all in the audience laughing, going, oh, I would never go there. You see, that 10% of the population, they tend to be actors, they tend to be in the creative field. If you are creative, you are highly suggestible. If you're creative, you are highly receptive to suggestions. Imagine saying to someone like Anthony Hopkins, hey, Tony, can you play a psychopath? Oh, yes, I can even play that when I put my makeup on and I can really do it so well. Because someone who is suggestible takes in suggestions. This will work, this won't work. Ask someone like Amy Winehouse to write a song about pain. She could knock out Back to Black in 10 minutes because she had that great ability to feel it and to put it on the page. Decorators, designers, artists, singers, performers, painters, anyone creative is suggestible. Some people hate that word, but it just means that you are very good at picking up suggestions. It means you're receptive. If you say to an, an artist, an actor, a singer, show me pain, they can do that. If you go, you know, it wasn't really very good, they go, no, I know. But they might go, oh, it was amazing. So it can be a two-edged sword being highly suggestible because what that means is you can be receptive to all kinds of suggestions. And the beauty about hypnosis, it teaches you to let in great suggestions, to give yourself amazing suggestions and to block out, to remove negative ones. And that's one of the things I love about hypnosis the most. It changes, I can't do, I can. That will never work to I'll make it work. I could do that, but I'm doing it right now. So when I work with actors, I always say, look, you're a very suggestible, creative person. And that's a good thing. The issue is not your mind, it's what you tell it. That will never work out. I'm really nervous about that. I'm terrified about this new part. I worked with an actress once who said, hey, I've just got the leading role in a movie and I'm terrified. I'm like, no, that's not terrifying. It's exciting. When you change the word terror, fear, scared to exciting, ready, on fire, then the mind accepts that. And you may not be one of the 10% of people that are really suggestible, really receptive to suggestions. It doesn't matter. You can still give yourself powerful, amazing suggestions. Personally, I would never put my hand up and go on stage at a hypnotic show, and I've been to many. I'm not sure it would even work for me on that stage. But even if I'm not that 10%, my life is giving myself amazing suggestions, great suggestions, powerful suggestions. I gave birth to my baby using hypnosis and it was an amazing experience. I've had dental work and surgery using hypnosis. And even if you don't want to do that, you can use hypnosis to recover. You can use it for anything. You can use it to turn fear into excitement or passion. You can use it to always sleep. I was taking a flight to Oman and the woman when we landed opposite me said, I noticed that you went to sleep the minute that plane took off and you woke up when it landed. That's amazing. Said, it's not amazing. It's hypnosis. I hypnotize myself to sleep wherever I am. I never get jet lag. I get an odd cold, but I hypnotize myself out of that too. And in fact, everything I have in my life, and I have a lot is down to hypnosis. I was told I would never get pregnant or carry a baby to full term. I used hypnosis to reverse that. I've had some encounters with illnesses and I've used hypnosis to reverse that too. And when I speak on stage, when I sit and write books, knowing that somebody might hate them, I use hypnosis to deal with that too.
anyone can be hypnotized, anyone at all. And being hypnotized just means going into an alpha or a delta brainwave. And the best way to get hypnotized is to look up, Keep your eyeballs up and keeping your eyeballs up, close the lids down. You know, when we have children, we know they're going to sleep when they start to roll up their eyes. I've hypnotized my cats because I get them to, I stroke them like that till they roll up their eyes. I speak to them in a hypnotic voice and they go into a trance. But in that trance, this is the people say, well, you can make me do anything. So going into hypnosis is easy. You do that every day. People aren't worried about going into hypnosis, they're worried about what will happen. What if I never come out? I heard about people never coming out. Where are these people who've never come out of hypnosis? They're not downtown in a warehouse somewhere. And by the way, if you could be made to do what you don't want to do, every hypnotist in the world would be a multi-millionaire. Because we could say, hey, just tick two zeros on the check. Just put me in your will. Clients send me flowers and candles and hampers. No one has ever sent me a Porsche. No one has ever sent me a Mercedes. Do you think I could say to my really rich clients when I'm hypnotizing, hey, you're so impressed with me. I would love a Porsche Carrera. I couldn't say that. And if I did, the client would not pick it up. I love the flowers. I love the baskets they send me, the cars. But no one has ever sent me a Ferrari and they never will, because I couldn't possibly suggest that. So remember, you may know a local hypnotist doing quite well, but if we were all that suggestible, they'd be multimillionaires by now. So I want you to understand that a hypnotist will give you amazing suggestions, but you hear what they say. I was working with a client one day who wanted to drop 80 pounds. And for some reason I said 80 kilos, they went, no, not 80 kilos, 80 pounds. They corrected me even though they were in hypnosis because they weren't asleep. They could take everything in. When I'm working with clients, they answer my questions because you're not asleep. So if you want to really be more hypnotized, well, here's what you do. First of all, make sure that you're in the right place. Phone off, a little sticker on the door saying don't ring the bell. Make sure you can be reasonably relaxed, but the hypnosis will relax you more. And then decide, I want this. I've chosen this, and I've chosen to feel great about it. That is my magic expression I use for everything. I've chosen this. I've chosen to feel great about it. I want it. I'm ready. I want it. Bring it on. And remember, you're not going to be unconscious. You're not going to be asleep. You're going to be super relaxed and really chilled. But hypnosis will not send you to sleep. It will wake you up to your excellence. And while the hypnosis is happening, you can start to go, hey, I'm letting this in. This is going in. I'm loving this. The mind learns by repetition. The first time you might go, well, I didn't really feel anything. And I was thinking about what I'm going to eat for lunch. But when you do it again and again, your mind goes, oh, you're doing that hypnosis stuff. You do that for 10 minutes a day. kind of like it. You're very relaxed. And there's nothing to worry about. I've made this familiar. Remember, we resist what is unfamiliar and return to what is familiar. And by playing a hypnotic audio every day, you will make it familiar. You'll like it. And all the fears and resistance will become completely unfamiliar. And then you can hypnotize yourself, even when you're on a train, a bus, going to the dentist. What are the four things you need to know about your mind in order to have phenomenal success across the board? Well, it's very simple. The first thing you have to understand is that your mind's job is not to make you happy. It doesn't care if you're happy or sad, fat or thin, success. It just cares if you're alive. You know, we're put on the planet really to reproduce ourselves. And of course, we have way more potential than that. But from your mind's perspective, if I'm your mind, my job is to keep you alive against all odds. 
for a limited number of years. And so in order for me to keep you alive, I have to work out what causes you pain or pleasure. And when you say things like, oh my God, that guy killed me, that that client made me want to die, it was the end of the world when I got dumped. Oh, this commute is driving me crazy. I'm dying under my paper. Your mind is like, okay, my job is to keep you alive. Every time you say it will kill me if I get dumped, I'm dying on the commute. This job will be the death of me. Your mind goes, mm-mm don't have a job if it's going to kill you. Don't date if it's going to kill you. Don't commute if it's going to make you want to jump off a bridge. Just stay home. How about I give you a lovely ulcer, lovely panic attacks, chronic diarrhea, anything that keeps you away from what you keep saying is going to kill you. So the most important thing to understand about your mind is that your mind's job is to do what what you tell it you want Secondly, you respond entirely to the pictures you make in your head and the words you say to yourself, which are yours to change at any time. Thirdly, the mind is hardwired, in fact, super coded to run back to what is familiar while running away from what is unfamiliar. That's a fact. But here's another fact. You can make anything you like familiar. I mean, peeing on the toilet wasn't familiar once. Getting food in your mouth and not your hair wasn't that familiar. If you stick a lens in your eye every day, you didn't just wake up and go, let me do that. It took a little bit of practice to take your finger and ram it onto your eyeball and then squeeze that to get that off again. And so if you remember these things about your mind, it does what it thinks you want. It bases it on what you tell it. The way you feel is down to the pictures you make in your head and the words you say, which you're free to change. And while it's a fact that you're wired to run away from unfamiliar and back to familiar, you can make anything you like familiar or unfamiliar for that matter. And really, it it actually boils down to how do you dialogue with you? We're all taught, if you want a great marriage, go and have some counseling, learn these great communications because you want a great business, learn how to talk to your cousin and be a great parent. Listen to some genius about how to talk to your baby. But no one says, hey, how do you talk to yourself? You go, oh, look at me. I'm just a big fat loser. Oh, that's never going to work out. That's driving me crazy. This kid is making me insane. Now your mind goes, well, no more babies for you. So as long as you can really start to listen to your internal dialogue and then change it, that will change your entire life. It sounds simple, but just because it's simple, that doesn't mean it isn't powerful and effective beyond belief because it really is. Because many people do this thing every day and everywhere. I'm getting better and better, but I'm not getting better and better. I've got this little saying Every day, life's a walk in the park and the sun is shining. Well, when I woke up today and it was raining and I straightway tread in some dog mess and I didn't really find that was real. So you have to understand a few key things about the mind because your mind can be your best friend when you understand what runs it. What, one of the things that runs the mind is repetition. No one says, hey, I went to the gym. I did 100 sit-ups. Where's my flat stomach? We understand, go to the gym every day, do 300 sit-ups, and then you will have a flat stomach if you repeat a technique. And the mind is no different. You must repeat something over and over again. But secondly, you have to understand a few things. The mind only works in the present tense. You can't say, next year I'm going to have a beach body. Next year I'm going to be a millionaire. Next year I'm going to find love. The mind only works in that's why children go, mommy, is it tomorrow today? Is it yesterday now? Because they don't understand. You get on a plane with a three-year-old and they go, are we there after five minutes? The mind works in the present tense only. And it really only responds to words that make a vivid picture. So saying, I'm not thinking about chocolate. I don't think about chocolate. I'm not thinking about Cadbury's milk chocolate. Of course, you're thinking about chocolate. So you've got to Use the words and even use words in front of us. Give you an example. Let's imagine you want to have a baby and you say things like, I really want to be pregnant. I love to be pregnant. I dream of being pregnant. That's all wrong. First of all, when you say, I want, I dream, I wish, you're not saying, I am, I will, I can. Dreaming, wishing, and hoping means that I have no ability to pull this off. So I just dream about it. Being pregnant is not what you want. You could be pregnant eight times and never have a baby. You need to say, I am super fertile. 
becoming pregnant now, carrying a perfect baby to full term. I want love. Well, how long do you want that for? An afternoon? A week? How about for the rest of your life? And then you've got to say, I'm attracting this, my soulmate, someone who is perfect. I'm perfect for him. Our, our worlds collide. I'm finding someone who's sparky and intelligent and loyal and kind. And, and everything I love in him, he loves in me or her. So you have to really turn the mind on with exciting words. They must be exciting. They must be descriptive. They must be relevant. And they must be up to date. It's like saying, I want more money. Well, have, what is more money? You can get $5, find it on the street. Does that mean you've got no? You must say, I want to manifest enormous wealth by being incredibly successful, monetizing a gift, taking it to market, having the courage, the confidence, the ability to sell something unique about me. Because the more descriptive you make it, the more your mind goes, oh, I know what you want. And now I know what you want. I'll move you towards it. But often what we want, we don't want. I want love, but it would kill me to get dumped. I want success, but I could never work seven days a week. And if I was the success, my relationship would go down the toilet. I, I want love, but it would kill me to be dumped. So you've also got to be very clear on what you want. And when you want it, like say you want to be a speaker or write a book or do a TED talk like you and I, you can't go, but, oh my God, if, if I went bright red, if I dried up, if nobody watched it, it would kill me. you got to keep your mind on what you want and want it so much that you don't let the reasons why you don't want it creep in. I want to ski, but what if I fall over and break my leg? You see, your mind is, a, is like a laser moving forwards, expanding. And the minute you add in, but what if I, I, I had love and they left me? What if I had a career then I was a terrible parent? You're actually saying, you know, I don't really want it after all. It's a lot of the things we say, your school days are the best days of your life. No, they're not. It's all downhill once you get to X. You've got more chance of getting abducted by a Martian when you're 50 than finding love. When you're 35, your fertility drops off a cliff. These things aren't even true. They're not relevant. And you have to have words relevant to you. So say you wanted to have a baby at 37. What is relevant is not to go, well, you know, I've got these old eggs. They're on a cell by day. And it's all a bit decrepit. You have to go, hey, I'm super fertile. I'm 37 and my eggs are 25 years old because we know that our body ages on its own time to if you, For instance, if you were 40 and you ran, your heart and lungs would be 25. Your knees and your skin, if you ran in the sun, could be 55. But your body ages on its own time to which is massively influenced by your thinking. So if you go, well, I'm too old to find love. I'm too old to get pregnant. I can't remember, you know, it's my age. I'm so tired. It's my age. You make that real. Every thought you think is a blueprint. Your mind and body start to work on is real. And so you have to say things like, hey, I'm super healthy. I mean, here we are in COVID and now we have a choice. Oh, my God, there's a virus. I'm going to get it. I'm terrified of going out. I don't touch anything. I've got to uh, sanitize all my groceries. Or you could say, well, I need to be careful. I need to be smart. But I have an incredible immune system. My Immune system is my line of defense. If I take vitamins, eat right, sleep right, you know, practice social and cleaning, washing my hands, I am going to be great. I'm healthy. I'm not going to live in fear because when we live in fear, it actually has a really bad effect on our immunity. So relevant is about, you know, let's not make this about the past and let's not go over the top about living in fear. Most people don't even understand our wiring in that we need to go back to what we know. So let's imagine when you grew up, you had a very distant, absent father who didn't pay you much attention, maybe diminished you and wasn't really there. And, and what our mind wants is for us to recreate what we know and give it a happy ending. So when we tend to have cold, distant parents, annoyingly, 
We're very attracted to cold, distant people, both men and women. Men say, I like cold, critical women. I seem to like women that are really bitchy and mean. And women say, I just go for the bad boys, you know, the ones who never call, cheat. Why do I like them? Well, because that behavior is so familiar, you recognize it and you want to recreate what you know, but change the ending. And really, life is too short to change the ending. We need to start changing the beginning. Instead of finding a cold, distant guy and turning him to somebody warm and loving, find someone warm and loving in the beginning. Uh, And you see, we can look at many people like, you know, Marilyn Monroe, Amy Winehouse, Princess Diana, all these women that had absent fathers that went for really the bad boys. Because that's our wiring. Let me recreate what I know. You know, if you put six sugars in your coffee and heavy cream and drink it or start your day with Coca-Cola, you actually want what you have all the time. If you stick meth in your arm or drink alcohol first thing in the morning, even though it's really bad for you, you want what is familiar. We see people who live on a terrible diet because it's familiar lie in the house and watch game shows. Three generations of families on welfare for no other reason than it's familiar. And we're so led to believe that, well, I can't change. And that's just not true. You can make anything unfamiliar, anything at all. So you need to take a look at, you know, if you have resolutions and goals and you're always failing, what is going on? I mean, I have many times that that's it, no sugar, and I've gone through three months and six months with no sugar ever. Then when you have some, you think, oh, I've ruined it now. And actually, sometimes you have to decide, okay, why don't I just say I'm going to eat sugar once a week? Or I'm only going to eat sugar on a weekend because that's an easier thing to stick to. And now I feel like a winner. Why don't I say I will work out four times a week? And that may just be nothing more than skipping on my living room carpet for five minutes while watching my favorite show. Because if you give yourself something impossible, I'm going to have this rigid diet, vegan, no fat, no sugar, no enjoyment, no social life. It's too easy to break it. So it's much better to give yourself better goals. And one of the goals you could have is if you want to make, let's say you want to make love or success familiar, your goal should be to simply say every day, I am making success familiar. I'm making success. We write it on your mirror, write it on your phone so that it pings. Try to say, write it on your computer, put it on your fridge and start to say, I am making success familiar. I'm making successful habits familiar. I'm making success in applying myself at work and really pushing myself familiar. So think of the wording first. Start to repeat it over and over again. Look at it, say it, state it, because it will wire and fire your mind to start moving towards that, to see, okay, you keep saying you're making success familiar. I'm doing it. And that um, statement says you have to take action. Now, what does that look like? Now, we have this misconception. I'm at home. And I'm waiting for motivation to knock on my door. And when Mr. Motivator turns up, I'm going to go out and run. I'm going to design my own business. I'm going to start dating online. But I'm just waiting for the motivation. Well, that's a terrible mistake because motivation doesn't turn up until you take action. You know, we've all done this thing about, I don't really want to clean out my closet, but you know what, I just just do the sock drawer. And now suddenly I've done, I think, well, I just do the underwear drawer. And wow, now I'm doing, I suddenly I'm into it. I didn't really want to go to the gym, but I thought I'd just go for 10 minutes. I just do 10 minutes on the stair mask and suddenly I've done a whole hour. So people who are very disciplined, they leave clues all the time. Disciplined people have a couple of things that might fascinate you. One is they do what they do not want to do to get to where they want to be. They also do it first. They want to be fit. They hate running. They get up and they run first. They don't love it. They go, I don't want to do this. I'm doing it first. So you must be prepared to do what you don't want. You must be prepared to do it first. And you'd reward us. I'm going to get up and run in the snow. But when I come home, I'm going to have the most yummy cappuccino and some eggs. And I'm going to have a nice hot shower. And you make everything. It's like your shower becomes a reward. Your bath becomes a reward. 
That sounds so simple because it is. So do what you don't want to do. Do it first. Delay gratification. Reward yourself after you've taken motivation. And then praise yourself a lot. Because if you work for yourself, then you're not getting praise. And praise is like a muscle. So instead of going, oh, I'm such an idiot. I didn't work out. I'm such a loser. I didn't call that client. Think I can't have breakfast till I call the client. And after I call, I'm going to go, well done. You did a great thing. Look at you. You called that client and you handled it so well. And now your mind's starting to link amazing pleasure to doing what you don't want to do first to taking action, to rewarding yourself for the action and for praising yourself. And now all of a sudden, all the things you don't want to do become exciting and compelling and actually very, very rewarding too. So it's a system and people are very disciplined, do it quite naturally. It doesn't matter if it's unnatural. It becomes natural over time, just like pressing weights isn't natural. If you do it every week, it becomes very natural. I'm going to move on now to the minds of super, super, super successful people. So I work with a lot of them, and I call them the one percenters because they have everything. They tend to have an amazing relationship. Someone like Richard Branson, who's been married for 30 years, maybe more. They tend to be very successful in business, and they also tend to share it. So... That's a small percentage, but you can join that percentage if you want to. But when I started to work with major CEOs and Olympic athletes and rock stars and royalty, I noticed that they all had the same habits. <clears throat> and so I'm going to tell you what these habits are. And honestly, it doesn't matter if you're born with these habits or if you adopt them. Just because you weren't born with them, that doesn't make any difference. If you make a decision, I'm going to acquire these habits, pick up these habits, adopt these habits and make them my own. And that's exactly what will happen. So here is what successful people do. They do what they hate. Successful people will do what they hate to get to where they want to be. And people who fail, they will give up their dream faster than do what they don't want to do. So one of my clients, who is a very, very famous, um, uh, and it's in a famous rock band, it's, it's not quite so famous now because this has been, he's been in it since the 80s, but he was telling me his story. And he was saying, you know, I had a wife and two kids and I always wanted to be a drummer in a band. That was my life's ambition, but I have a wife and two kids and I didn't come from money. In fact, I came from no money at all. And I had to work to pay the bills. Now in the 80s in England, before the internet, they used to have a newspaper called Melody Maker, and you'd open it, and it would say, audition on Friday in Camden for a rock guitarist, or audition on Saturday in Hampstead for a vocalist. And it had all these auditions listed, and you'd get it, and you'd go to the audition. And then they might go, very good, come back tomorrow at 2 o'clock, and we're going to audition you again. So he couldn't have a regular job, because he had to get the paper, find out the auditions, go to the auditions, and then they often did a call back and so he became a taxi driver and he wasn't made. He could only do night cabbing because he had to be free all day to audition, but he was exhausted and it, he never got enough money. So he said, okay, I'm going to go and work in McDonald's. And he got a job in McDonald's and it mortified him to go to McDonald's. And the day he was due to start, he got a call and said, oh, by the way, you know, you came for that audition last week. Um, we, you've got the job. And he became the drummer in an, an amazingly phenomenal band. And when you tell people the story, they go, oh my God, I'd never work at McDonald's. Oh my God, how embarrassing. I'm like, but you're missing the point. He was prepared to work night shifts in McDonald's. He could audition during the day so he could be a rock star. And you would give up the chance of going to an audition. It's like saying, I want to be a movie star and I've got to get the stage. And this was another newspaper and open it up. I don't know when the castings are, but I also have to have a living. So I'm going to work nights as a cleaner so that I can get that magazine, the stage, and always be in an audition and put myself there and eventually get cast and be in a play, be in a movie, get seen, be in another one. You're going, well, I'd never be a cleaner. No, not me. But they give up their dream because they don't want to do what they don't want to do. And people who succeed do what they hate. So I was taking a flight from New York to LA with um, a celebrity. I was working on a show with very overweight celebrities. And I, I went to pick this guy up in his hotel and he came out in a fur coat and flip-flops and it was snowing. And I'm like, why have you got on flip-flops? He goes, there's freaking terrorists. 
I've got to take my shoes off at the airport, and because I'm so fat, I can't get them off, and if I get them off, I can't get them on again. So I have to wear flip-flops or, or hotel slippers in the snow because of terrorists. I'm like, but it's not the terrorists, darling. It's because you're very fat. <laughs> really the terrorist fault. <laughs> That's why you've got to take the slippers off. But anyway, so we got on the plane, and it was so interesting. He didn't eat or drink a thing, and I said, why not? He said, I can't get in the bathrooms on an aeroplane. He said, you know, I just can't get in there. So... I don't eat or drink anything because I'm so scared of being stuck in a plain bathroom and I have to ask for a seat extender. It's really embarrassing. And I said, okay, but well, why don't you work out? And he went, because I'm so famous and I've got this famous persona. I'm the happy fat guy. My whole thing is I'm a happy fat guy. I talk about it all the time. And so I can't go to a gym because then I'm, I'm a fake. And I can't even have a personal trainer because I'm a fake because I've got this whole image, I'm the happy guy who loves being fat. But inside, I didn't love it. I said, okay, well, here's what you're gonna have to do. You gotta go work out. People who work out don't go, yes, I love it. So to his credit, I told him the story about all my clients who are successful and who've lost half their body weight by doing what they hate. They never wake up and go, oh my God, it's 5 a.m. and I'm going for a hike, because he had to work out. He had to run up and down where he lived in Laurel Canyon at four in the morning in the pitch black, so nobody could see. But he never woke up and go, oh, four o'clock, putting on my running shoes, going up that hill, 600 pounds, yes! He didn't love it, but of course he did it. And of course then he did begin to love it, and then he lost a ton of weight. I went to his wedding, he danced with his wife. It was a beautiful thing, because he did what he hated. So people who succeed are always prepared to do what they hate. And they always say, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. So people who succeed will do three jobs. They understand that, you know, I've got to go to college and do this. I've got to work weekends and maybe I don't see enough of my kids, but it's not forever, it's for now. But you've got to prepare to do what you hate. So I write books and it's not always fun. It's a very isolating thing. And when I got my first book deal, I gave them the money back because I just couldn't sit in my house on my own and write, because all I could think of was how boring it was. And then I realized that I looked at all my clients who've made it and they don't do that. They go, I hate this, I'm doing it now. Because that's the second thing of people who succeed. They do what they hate first. They gotta fire someone, it's the first thing they do. They gotta make a difficult phone call, it's the first thing they do. Now, I'm, I do that as much. I wake up and go, what do I not want to do? map out this talk, well, I'm gonna do it now then because successful people do what they hate first. But you see, they don't think, yeah, I'm such an amazing person. They have a different brain that goes, well, I don't wanna do it, so am I gonna think about it all day? I've gotta call in this member of staff and go, look, I've just discovered you're taking money out of the company, and they're my friend, and I've gotta call them in and, and, and bring that up. But if I wait all day, I've got that feeling of dread. Oh my God, I still haven't done it. It's now six o'clock, I'll do it tomorrow. And then they have the dread all the next day. So really it naturally go, I, I couldn't stand the, the anxiety. I thought, come in at 7 a.m., I got them in the office, I sorted it all out. I was like, what a relief. And the others go, no, I just keep putting it off. So the people who do it naturally don't do it because they're virtuous. They do it because they don't want to carry around that anxiety all day of, ah, what do I hate? Let's do that later. And even going to the gym, if you hate going to the gym, go first thing in the morning. Because if you go, well, I'll go at four. Oh, no, I need to eat now, I'm really hungry. No, I can't go to the gym because I've just eaten. I'll go at five, and now someone's just called me, and now I can't, no, I haven't gone to the gym. I'll go tomorrow at four, and tomorrow never comes. But when you do what you hate first, here's what happens. You feel like a winner. Because winners do what they hate first. First of all, they do what they hate. That's good enough in itself and they do it first, and hate may be a strong word. Maybe you want to say, I do what I dislike first. So my client who became a rock star was fully prepared to work in a burger bar in order to achieve his dream. My client who got out of bed at 4 a.m. and walked up and down Laurel Canyon in a sweat was prepared to do what he hated because he had a dream of marrying this beautiful girl whose parents said, well, he's gonna drop dead on the job, I mean, he's a 600 pounds. You can't marry someone of 600 pounds. He's gonna kill himself. And, and she, he wanted to marry her, she wanted to marry him. But she also wanted her parents to be very happy, did what he hated, and, and ended up having a much happier life. So 
I want you to think about what do you believe that you hate to do or dislike? What is it that you dislike? And how good are you at avoiding that and putting it off, which is normal? And how different would your life be if you did it first? So in my company, we have a little motto now, uh, what do I hate? Let's do that first. Let's do what I hate first because you feel good all day long when you do what you hate first. And if you do what you hate last, you feel terrible already because you're waiting. It's like waiting to be punished or, you know, um, so a lot of people will, so for instance, kids at school will, when the teacher says, okay, we're all going to read out loud, who's going first? And the kid that puts their hand up does it first says, but you know, I couldn't, I didn't want to be the last one. I was dreading reading in class. So I thought, let me get it over with. And the kids that do that, put out their hand and go, I'll read first, I'll go first, I'll do it first, are the ones that naturally become phenomenally successful because they automatically do what they hate first doesn't matter if you've never done that in your life. It doesn't matter. I mean, you didn't pee in the toilet once, but no one here says, I, I still don't do that. Well, I hope not. And just because you didn't do something, it doesn't mean you can't acquire habits. You can acquire and adopt any habit. So I want you all to commit that you're going to go home and say, right, I'm going to go to work and say, what do I put off? What do I put to the back? What do I really dislike? I'm going to do that first. And do it first every day until it isn't what I do, it's who I am. Because it isn't enough to play it and go, oh, I just did it today. I made a difficult phone call. I talked to a really difficult customer. I rang someone up who owes me a ton of money and said, okay, we need now to work out a payment plan for this. I did the difficult stuff. Check out my next video here. I see all my clients and they all say the same thing. I'm waiting for motivation. You know what? Motivation doesn't go, here I am. I'm motivation. I'm at your door and I've come to motivate you. You are firing new neurons. The mind